Hello, and welcome to Songs for the Struggling Artist, the blog cast. This is episode 349. My name is Emily Rainbow Davis. Thank you for listening to the blog cast. It is 725 in the evening as I record this, and it is still light outside. Spring is the greatest. <laughs> I mean, it's not like particularly warm out there, but flowers are blooming and it is not dark at 725, which is very nice. So today's blog is about uh, what happened since I gave blood last year. Um, I'll read it to you in just a second. I don't think there's much to prepare you for, aside from if you, this one sort of follows on the heels of one from last year, which was called, Have You Ever Tried This Before? And I think it was called, Have You Ever Tried This? Yes, it was called, <laughs> Have You Ever Tried This Before? Um, and this is sort of a follow-up on that, but I, I think you don't need to have heard that episode or read that blog to know what's going on here. Um, it's essentially, that that piece was about you know, what it's like to be the, like, novice at something, to have something be your first experience of something. And this one is about what happens after that. And it is called Targeting the Regulars. Last year, I wrote about my experience of giving blood for the first time. I read it again in the process of preparing the 2022 zine, and it made me think about what has happened since. You may remember how genuinely terrible the blood donation folks were at welcoming me, a newcomer. It was clear they were set up for regulars. As soon as I donated, the one time, it was clear that I was now a regular in the system's eyes. Whereas before I donated, I never heard anything about blood donation. Now that I was a regular, I hear from the blood center several times a month. I get more messages and phone calls from the blood people than I get from my family and friends. It's wild. Having donated one single time, I, along with anyone else who's donated, am expected to solve the citywide blood shortage. I suppose they figure they got blood out of you once, They're going to get it to happen again. And I will say, I would like to donate again. I really do want to help. It will happen eventually. But the more they harass me, the more guilt trips they employ, the less likely I become to respond. This may work with some people, but for me, the surest way to get me to drag my feet and calling someone back is to call multiple times or say something like, I need you to call me back right away. I mean, I'll probably call you back eventually, but it's going to be a long while. (laughs) The blood folks have triggered my foot dragging self and none of us are pleased about it. The thing of it is, aside from just how damn inconvenient it is, Part of why I haven't returned to donate is knowing how little effort they're putting in to expanding their donors. They're wasting enormous resources on me, trying to get me to come back, trying to make me believe the entire blood crisis is falling on my miserly blood hoarding shoulders, trying to convince me to return when they could be using those resources to make blood centers more accessible, open more often available to just pop in and donate in more locations. It seems to me that rather than hiring people to call me up every week, they should hire people to recruit and welcome new donors to expand the pool of people who can help. There's something so macabre about an institution that once it gets a taste of your blood, just can't leave you alone until you give up more of your blood. We are literally talking about blood. I mean, I'll give it to them when I want to give it to them, but it's really pretty shocking to me how poorly organized this system is in getting such a necessary resource. I suspect part of it has something to do with systems and software. It makes me think of canvassing software for elections. 
A few years ago, I did some canvassing for Zephyr Teachout's campaign for Attorney General of New York. My canvassing partner had the software for our door knocking, where we had the names and addresses of all the people in the area who were registered Democrats and had voted in previous elections. We didn't knock on anyone's door who was an independent, and we didn't knock on anyone's door who wasn't a regular voter. We were, essentially, only harassing the people who had donated blood before, so to speak. And it is very logical. Of course, voters are more likely to vote. Of course, you'll be able to check the box of, yes, voting for her, or whatever information you need, in a pool of people more likely to vote. It allows for politicians to make sure their polling reflects well on their progress. I know this is how it's done now. As someone who votes in every single election, no matter how silly, I am a prime target for every single Democratic or progressive candidate using this software, and they all use this software. They can often see how often I vote in their apps. I mean, I once went in to vote for a candidate who was running unopposed in a primary, a candidate I didn't even like. So when I tell you I always vote, I am not kidding. But it all really feels like a terrible waste of resources. As much as I enjoyed meeting our future city council member at our door, I think her time could have been more productive in the long run. We were already fans of hers. Wouldn't it be more useful to go chat with someone who hasn't voted in city council elections, partly because they don't know anything about them? No one needs to convince me how important local elections are. I know. I know who the DA in our county is, and I know who would have been a better one. That city council member, actually. But for someone who just votes in, say, presidential elections... A conversation with a hopeful city council member about our local issues might shift their voting patterns entirely. We have abysmal voting rates in this country. We have abysmal voting rates in this city, too. The canvassing apps only exacerbate this already problematic situation. I understand why they make things easier. It's a lot smoother to talk to registered Democrats about an election they're already aware of than to talk to someone who might be hostile to the candidate or the ideas or the political party. It does make sense, but it narrows the field. And that narrowing surely plays a part in the polarization of our current political situation. But for the numbers, of course, the limited set of people make sense because, of course, those who have voted before are the most likely to vote again, even if it's not for your candidate. And those who have donated blood are the most likely to donate again, just based on the numbers. But we're not just trying to reach the most likely candidates for this stuff, I hope. Both blood donation and voting are things that we should get the maximum number of people to do. And that means expanding our reach to everyone, not just the regulars. And that's why the blood center should chill out on calling me all the time. Maybe just stay open for a few more hours in the afternoon on the one day they collect blood in this neighborhood every four months or so. Or they could open in the evening. I'd love to pop in on the way to dinner. Meanwhile, just today, a canvasser came to my door to remind me to vote on June 27th. That's three months away. That's a lot of lead time and effort to remind me to do something I'm definitely going to do anyway. With this much lead time, they could get tons of new people to register to vote for the first time. I wish they'd do that instead. The best ending of this would have been me donating blood. Finally, again. But alas, I have not. I, I, I would like to have done. But uh, it's been a while, I think, since they've done a drive in my neighborhood. 
It's been over a year now, I guess, because a few weeks ago I got a notice from them that was like, your benefits are about to run out. You got to donate within a year to take advantage of your blood donation points. And I was like, what the heck are blood donation points? Maybe you should have told me about those before. Uh, Also, like, it's just, it's just dumb. Like, it's just dumb. Come on. I feel like this is an area that this country could use a really good, like, redo. Like, just, like, start over with this whole, what, how we do this. Just a brand new way. Brand new way. I'm sure health insurance and stuff is to blame. Anyway, it, there are many reasons things are very silly in healthcare-related things. I don't know what those are in this particular department. But they're so ridiculous. Anyway, so uh, the song today is uh, Suzanne Vega's Blood Makes Noise, because I've been thinking about doing it for a while, and uh, it's actually perfect. It's perfect, because the blood people are making noise, and it's about blood, and so is this post. So I'll play that for you in just a minute. Meanwhile, thank you so much for listening. If you like the blogcast, please tell someone about it. Like, review, subscribe. Um, And if you're just joining me, I think we got a little boost on Amazon. So if you're listening on Amazon, you may be aware uh, for the first time of this podcast's existence. So welcome and thank you for listening to the new people And also, thank you for listening to the people who've been here a while, and to everyone. If you would like to help support this podcast with your money, that would be amazing. Patreon.com slash Emily R. Davis is a great place to start and finish. You can do everything there if you'd like. Uh, There's also Ko-fi, there's PayPal. All those links are in the show notes. On Kofi, I'm running a fundraiser that so far no one has donated to, but I I will tell you more about it as time goes by, uh, for uh, going to this uh, artist residency on the island of Crete in Greece. Um, So if you would like to be the first to contribute to that, that would be amazing. Uh, That's on Kofi. There's a link to that in the show notes. And... That is all, I believe. So, song. Uh, I'm going to play this on ukulele. There is a drum track, a loop from GarageBand, because it's a pretty high production. Like, the song, part of the charm, I think, of the song is is the drive of it, is the sort of sound of the heartbeat of the blood vibe. I don't know. So I felt like I needed to put in a a rhythm track. And it also, it it was, I kept slowing down and speeding up in different places. So the drum keeps me honest. So, yeah. Um, Yes. So this is from Suzanne Vega's 99.9 Fahrenheit Degrees album which is one of my favorites. It's a real it's a real poppy kind of fun situation if you're surprised to learn about that period of Suzanne Vega's career. I enjoy it very much. Uh, so here is Blood Makes Noise. Yes, I really, really would, but the din in my head is too much and it's no good. I'm standing in a windy tunnel shouting through the roar. Like to give the information you're asking for, but blood makes noise. It's a ringing in my ear, blood makes noise. And I can really hear you in the thickening of fear. The details and the facts But there's something in my blood Denies a memory of the acts So just forget it, Doc I think it's really cool that you're concerned Have to try again 